favor. The two of you are about to change the world. That's no small thing to think about. That's a monumental thing. So both of you have to understand the consequences of doing it or have the strength not to do it. But you have been programmed into a society where walking away from this sacred responsibility becomes a casual thing. What the women did not like that I pointed out that the rape of black teenagers along the shores of Africa in the slave castles, on the boats, on the plantation, was the beginning of widespread black teenage pregnancy. I also pointed out that there are three million people in the world called Eurasians, half Asian, half white. There's not ten marriages between whites and Eurasians. In South Africa, there's over a million people called colored coloreds. That means between cohabitation between the African man, I mean the white man and the African woman. And then there's another almost a million called Cape Colors, co co cohabitation between the Asian Cape Malayans and all these people who came in later and the white. There's not one marriage between them. Now who is the greatest deserter of women in the whole world? Now, I'm not trying to justify a single black man who deserted any black woman. And I'm saying that every single one should be called to his responsibility and made to shoulder his responsibility. But look at the historical origins of how this thing started with the remaking of, of his mind, with the remaking of the condition where he had no security, where well, he must rise each day and literally beg for the right to live to the end of the day, where well, he, he does not inherit a job normally. He doesn't get his bread normally. He literally engaged in a form of protracted begging. And your begging for one day don't carry over to the next day. The next day, Another form of begging, another form of asking for permission to live to the end of the next day. And the next day it starts all over again. Look at what it is doing to his spirit. Look what it is doing to his very soul, the very dignity. Then he goes on the weekend and worships the white God. And in the rest of the week, you expect the father black father in the home to have full respect. When you worship, you're worshiping the oppressor, the symbol of the oppressor. Now, what the Zulu people try to do is to preserve the concept of African sovereignty, the African nation's State. Now, the Zulus did not start in South Africa or Southern Africa. Nearly every African in Africa came from another part of Africa. And the one thing we need to study in order to understand any portion of Africa are the migrations within Africa. The Zulus once lived along the coast of Southern Africa, of, of Eastern Africa, before they were called Zulus. It was a group called the Ngunu. There's an Ngunu group inside of the Zulus to this day. We meet these groups in a book by an Arab writer, 
The book's called Gems of Travel and Meadows of Gold or something. I remember his name in a few minutes. But the book was written 947 A.D., over a thousand years ago. And he encountered that group. They were living in East Africa then. But I'll tell you something about certain African groups. Not just the Zulu. The Can has the same trait. The Musi has the same trait. Anytime they are faced with a force they can't deal with, they pack up and move some other place. Can't fight it? Get out of the way. Here's a group come now, antagonistic, want to bother with your land, want to bother with your cattle, want to bother with your money, with your women. All right, let's go find another home. Africa's so big, you know, you can walk 10 miles away and find another country. Ain't nobody out of me, a country that's free for you to take if you want to, because ain't nobody there. The Zulus, when Islam hit that coast, began to move inland. Then they moved inland until they moved into the Congo Basin. Now the Congo Basin got crowded with other groups moving out of the way of Islam. See, everybody trying to purify Islam quite forget the damage it did. People trying to move out of the way of the Islamic slave trade. People trying to move out of the way of warring groups and they were not a part of either part of the war and they don't want to be caught in the crossfire, they just pick up and go. The African is a natural nomad. That don't mean he didn't build cities. But he'll, he'll, he'll move in a minute, you know, and go build a city some other place. So now the Zulus moved inland. And when the inland became crowded with herds and people with their flocks and cattle and sheep and goats, not for war purposes, not for any disagreement with anybody. They were living with a magnificent people. The people of the Congo, the Bashongo people, one of the finest people in all of Congo, the Bashongo or the Kuba people. The Kuba people didn't say go. Nobody said go. They didn't see the space they needed. So they wanted more space and they began to move. Not only the Zulus, but other groups began to move down into the open land mass further to the south. The group with the preface Amma to their name moved closer to the coast. And then the Zulus were referred to as Amma Zulu follower of Zulu. The, great, the first great leader was named Zulu. They took his name. The other groups with the preface Ba to their name, we can find these groups still there. The Baman Waita, Bamwakatsis, the Borlongs, they veered inland. Now, the home of the great B group is now Botswana. There was a group called Botswana, that the third wave of the B group. The Borlongs went further, further into Central Africa. Later, they would have a good relationship with the, uh, they would join the Zulus, many of them as officers in the Zulu army. All right, now, now they settled. The Zulus settling along the coast around Natal, the coastal part of southern Africa. Further to the south, in the tip of South Africa, near the Cape, it's another people that had been there all along. They'd been there so long, no one could remember, and, and they're not too clear on it. These are people called the Koshon. Koshon San people. If you meet them, you say, what's your name? Koshon. 
He told me his language, he said, Koshon, Koshon. If you're talking about the two of them, they said, Koshon Sen, S-E-N, Koshon Sen. If you're talking to a Sen, he said, Sen Koshon. Like two Vaudevillians arguing over building. Who, who gets the first name on the marquee? But uh, if you talk to a, a Koshon, he said that they are the seniors, the Sen people are the juniors. Talk to Sen, he said, that he's the senior, the Koshons are the juniors. <laughs> now, this don't start any fight, but some of the best jokes you've ever heard between them is about who's the senior and who's the, uh, and who's the junior. See, good-natured kidding that white people make fights out of, the Africans make good jokes out of and good relationships out of, even dance around.